friends on this stage today continue to be inspired by your spirit and uplift your son. Oh, Lord, we, we want to leave this place today knowing that we have been in your presence. So guide us, bless us, and anoint my lips so they may reveal your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, praise team, and good morning, Antioch. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's good to worship him in spirit and in truth. For those of you who don't know, my name is Gressford Thomas. I am the pastor of the Concord International Seventh-day Adventist Church, not too far from here, but also a little further to the south, the San Ramon Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church as well. And I'm happy today to have the opportunity to be able to uh, open up the word and break the bread of life with you today. I was sharing with my wife earlier that I, uh, though I'm speaking today, I feel like it's kind of a day off for me because usually I speak at both my churches on a Sabbath. So I said only one sermon today. This is, this is a, a good day and, and I'm happy to be able to present it to you. The title of my message today is, When Did We See You? When Did We See You? Now, before we answer this question in all sincerity, I want to start by talking about something that's close to my heart. And, and that is this, um, this aspect and this uh, task of planning and time management. I know it's a weird thing to talk about, but for most of my adult life, I have been an individual who takes time to plan. If you look in my, my closet at home, they're full of planners, and, and now I use my iPad as a digital planner. Planning is so very important to me. I've been a planner all my life, and, and every year like clockwork, and my wife can attest to this, I, I purchase a new daily planner. I want to track my appointments, I want to track my tasks, significant events that happened in my life that I can look back on, and, and memorable happenings. Those are all important to me to track. Now, this has become especially important to me as I've become a district pastor. I have two churches, and there are many things that I, I have to keep track of, and, and many things I still forget, even though I have a planner. But uh, planning is so very helpful. I live by the mantra, I live by the saying, failing to plan is planning to fail. And I think you've all heard that before. But what I found over the years is that there is another dimension to planning. It's called preparation. Now, to some listening, those two words may sound the same. Planning, preparation, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. It sounds like the same thing. But in, in my earnest exploration of this topic, it led to the discovery that revolutionized the way that I went about my personal planning process. My planning in, involves a structured to-do list and, and, and context for what I am, anticipate happening. Now, in an ideal world, it's, the to-do list should be enough, a list of things that I'm going to do through the course of the day. But let's face it, how many times do things go as planned? How many times does that happen? Planning and planning alone, it assumes that all will go exactly how you think it will go without taking anything else into consideration. But life has a way of allowing things to happen to kind of change your plans. The problem is this. You can create a plan, but things happen. If you're driving on the road and there's an accident, it makes you a little late for work. Per perhaps uh, there's an unexpected phone call that, that happens during the course of the day. It happens to me all the time, and I think it's going to take 15 minutes, and two hours later, I'm, I'm, I'm off the phone. A, a task that I was going to put off till tomorrow that now has come to be an urgent task that I must complete today. 
And then there are those tasks that you think it's only going to take me 10 minutes, but two hours later, you're still completing that particular assignment. We cannot plan for the things out of our control. We can only anticipate and prepare effectively to handle these potential roadblocks or frustrations. This is where preparation comes in. Yes, I'm going somewhere with this. We're going to get in the Bible in a few moments. Preparation, preparation, what it does is it, is it trains you for what to expect. It, it puts you in a position where you can handle what you didn't see coming. Preparation looks to the meaning of the plans, and, and it gives us the insight to be ready to move in a different direction when plans fail. To summarize the difference between these two actions, and, and, and this is going to be the, the, uh, the phrase that I'm going to be uh, referring back to as we go through our scripture today, it, planning leads to awareness, preparation leads to readiness. Planning leads to awareness, preparation leads to readiness. Today we're going to explore the importance of these two words. And we're going to do it in the context of the fact that as Seventh-day Adventists, we are awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's something that is embedded in the name of, of our church and, and something that all of us are, are looking forward to. We're going to be focusing on Matthew chapter 24 and 25 today, and we're going to be looking at a concern that the disciples had and how Jesus addressed those concerns by looking at both planning and preparation. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Matthew 24 first. And in Matthew 24, we see what happens is that in, Jesus had just been grieving over being rejected as Lord and Savior in, in Matthew 23. And his disciples were, were exiting the great city of Jerusalem. Now, as they leave that city, just getting a little low here. Okay. Think I'm, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. All right. As they, as they leave that city, what we see is that Jesus immediately redirects their attention. He predicts something that at that time was inconceivable, that the greatest architectural wonder in the Middle East would one day be entirely destroyed. Some of us are familiar with this, found in Matthew 24, verses, uh, verses 1 through 3. Now, this revelation, when Jesus told them that, that this would happen, it was shocking to them, and, and it left the disciples in a state of, of wonder and, and confusion. How can this happen? But at that moment when Jesus shared this information with them, they held their peace. They held their peace. I would imagine that they needed time to reflect on, on, on what Jesus was saying, on, on these shocking words that, that this great temple that King Herod had built would one day be destroyed. They needed to carefully consider the impact and also the absurdity of the words that their mentor, Jesus Christ, had given to them. The biblical narrative continues with Jesus and his entourage, his disciples, walking east across the Kidron Valley and climbing the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And as they stopped the top the Mount of Olives and, and to rest, it's kind of a little climb, their gaze was, was set once again on the Temple Mount. They saw that temple from a distance. And all they could think was, wow. I had the privilege of climbing the Mount of Olives, and I remember being impressed by the view of the city today. I can only imagine what it looked like when the disciples were looking at the temple. The beauty of what they saw, the temple, Herod's temple was made of marble and gold. It was 15 stories high, which 
Today's standard is not that high, but back then, that was a skyscraper. It was an impressive building. It, it, was, it was constructed of, 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 of white Maleke limestone. It was a limestone that came straight out of Jerusalem. And, and the veneer of the, of the temple was marble and gold. You know, historians tell us that the rectangular blocks were, were polished to reflect the sunlight so that it would stand out. I would imagine that as they're on the Mount of Olives and, and they're looking out at the, at the temple, that, that it, was, it was that perfect time of day when, when the sun was just shining uh, on, on, and reflecting off of the, the, the marble, and, and it just looked so impressive. And it was at this time when they were beholding this breathtaking view uh, that they thought back to what Jesus said, that the temple would one day be destroyed. And, and and they thought, how? How can this compound, how can God's house, the place where his presence dwells, how can that happen? It's absurd. Let's join the disciples in Jesus on the Temple Mount. Kept you in suspense enough. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to be looking at verse 3. Matthew 24, 3. I'm going to put this here so I can... Hold my Bible, Matthew 24, verse 3. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. I'm reading from the New King James. And it says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples' question had two parts. First of all, when will this happen that you're talking about? When will this temple, when will the temple fall? And the second question was, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And the reason they asked this question in tandem is because if the temple falls, it must be the end of time. Jesus must be coming because if the temple falls, it, it, time is up. Jesus, as he was talking to his disciples, he knew that they expected that Jesus Messiah would reign in Rome, that he would inaugurate his kingdom soon, and just as, as England is waiting to inaugurate King Charles, they, they were waiting to inaugurate King Jesus. They wanted to know, when will you sit on the throne? When is our, oh, excuse me, when is your day coming? They wanted to know the sign of when his kingdom would arrive. Now, Jesus spends the 24th chapter of of, uh, of, of Matthew is, is all about Jesus explaining what the time of the end is like. They think he's describing one event, but he's actually describing two events. He's telling them, I I'm going to give you the sign of when the temple will fall, but I'm also going to give you a sign of the end of the age. And, and contrary to what you're thinking, there are two different events. He goes on in Matthew 24 to explain the end of the age in terms of political signs, economic signs, natural signs, and religious signs. He gave them a prophetic picture of that time, including the events leading up to it. He talked about events in the far future connected to the last day and, and the second coming when he would come to earth. But one thing we see that he did also is, is as many of the Old Testament prophets had done, Jesus predicted both near and distant events without putting them in chronological order. He kind of talked about them, and, and, and it wasn't saying this is going to happen and then this is going to happen, and it's going to be two days until this happens and another year until the next event happens. The common destruction of Jerusalem and, and the temple only foreshadowed 
a future destruction when Jesus would come in his glory. In order to understand how this prophecy worked, and, and, and I love this illustration, picture yourself standing on a mountaintop looking across a distant mountain range. The mountain peaks appear to be right next to one another, when in reality they could be miles apart. The valleys in between are separating them. Jesus' prophecies, they, they pictured these mountain peaks as significant future events, but we have the valleys where we don't know how much time is in between those significant events. Some of the disciples, they, they lived to see the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, while some of the events we see in Matthew 24, they haven't happened yet. The truth of Jesus' prediction regarding Jerusalem, though, it assured the disciples and it assures us today that everything else that he predicted will also come to pass. Amen? These signs give us the assurance that Jesus is coming soon. These signs give us the tools we need to plan for the return of Jesus. Earlier in the message, I made a statement about the difference between planning and preparation. Planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. The signs of the times in, in Matthew 24 and, and other parts of the Bible make us aware of the soon return of Jesus. We don't have exact years, we don't have exact dates and, and times, but as we review them, our awareness level is raised. We become attentive to the state of things happening in our world and, and we become aware of the fact that we need to turn our focus and our eyes to Jesus. He's coming soon. We become aware of the urgency to spread the good news of his coming and his love for us that he expressed on Calvary to a world that is desperately searching for belonging, for hope, and for peace. Here's how the Bible explains what it means to be aware. Matthew chapter 24, I'm looking at verse 42 now, skipping a little further ahead. In, in Matthew 24, verse 42, here's what Jesus says in reference to this. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. The word in Greek for watch is Gregorio, and it means to become fully awake. It means to give strict attention to something. It means to be cautious, to take heed and care so that no destructive calamity comes your way. The part of speech for that word, watch therefore, is, is the present active imperative. And, and by that, all I mean is it conveys a command which is saying, keep watching. Watch and don't stop watching. Amen. We need to be living with an awareness that eternity is right around the corner. The signs help us to remain alert and aware, and, and the purpose of these signs is to help us plan for eternity. The signs don't prepare us for eternity. They help us to plan for eternity. When we're tempted to align ourselves with the ways of the world, our awareness of the hope of eternity is ignited when we see the end, the signs of the times, as shown in Matthew 24, Daniel, and Revelation. There's a difference between planning and preparation, though. The signs are meant to help us plan for eternity. And we as Adventists, we are master planners when it comes to the second coming. Our church was started with a plan based on a prophecy in, in Daniel. It, it was a flawed plan at first, but, but it raised awareness, which led to a movement that we are a part of today. 
Planning is important. It's part of our Christian legacy. We have studied and embraced God's plan for the future, but oftentimes, oftentimes I found that we stop at Matthew 24. We know the plans, and that seems to be good enough for us. By this, what I'm saying is we remain satisfied with planning and leave out another part that Jesus emphasizes in Matthew 25, preparation. In Matthew 25, Jesus shows us how to prepare for the second coming. In Matthew 24, he tells us how to plan for the second coming. There's so much to unpack in Matthew 25 and I have a limit, limited amount of time, but my focus is gonna be in our scripture reading today in verses 31 to 40. We're gonna be focusing on this judgment day parable in order to understand what it means to be prepared. But before we get there, I wanna quickly review the two parables that precede the parable in verse 31 to 40. Matthew 25, 1 through 13, we have the parable of the ten young ladies. We've all, all probably heard that parable before. A parable of ten young women, and it's all about being prepared for the second coming. Not about planning now, it's about preparation. Matthew 25 begins by equating what he's about to say in a familiar manner, but it's a little different. He says, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened in Matthew 25, verse 1. We see this phrase often in Matthew. For example, in Matthew 13, we see the kingdom of heaven prepared, to, compared, I should say, to a pearl. It's, it's compared to a treasure to a net, to wheat and tares, to, to leaven. He compares it to many things. But in Matthew 25, he, he's, he's flipping it a little bit because in this final time that he talks about the kingdom of heaven, this final time that we see it in this gospel, he uses it just a little differently. In this place, in Matthew 25, the kingdom of heaven is spoken of in the future tense. Matthew 13, he's talking about the present tense. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. In Matthew 25, he's saying, this is what it will be like right before I come. Now, now for us. Jesus is looking to the arrival of the kingdom at his second coming. He's looking at the end of the age. He's looking to our time, the time that we are living in. So if we are to be paying attention to a text of scripture in the gospel of Matthew, it is what he's saying in Matthew 25, because he wants us to be prepared when he comes. This is why it's important that we study this chapter. Let's take a quick look and review the parable. I'm, I'm not going to go into it deeply because of the time, but, but we have 10 young women. They're all invited to a wedding, all 10 of them. They all had lamps, all 10 of them. They all had oil in their lamps initially, all 10 of them. They all slept when the bridegroom was delayed, all 10 of them. They all prepared their lamps when the bridegroom came. For all intents and purposes, these young ladies seem to be pretty much identical. Each one was invited to the wedding and they made plans to make sure they arrived early. All of them planned to be at the wedding. They understood the plans. But we are told in this parable that there were five of them that were wise and five that were foolish. We, we are told what made them foolish was one seemingly insignificant item, and, and that's just extra oil. They should be able to get oil anywhere or borrow it. They had the entire wedding planned about what they were going to wear and, and what they were going to do and, and what they were going to do when they got into the wedding. It was all planned, but they were not prepared to meet the bridegroom. 
They made arrangements to enjoy the festivities. But as I noted earlier in the message, sometimes we make plans, and plans don't go as we want them to go. There was a delay. They didn't plan for that delay. They were not prepared for that delay. And, and this is where we see the difference between planning and preparation. Planning leads to awareness. Preparation leads to readiness. They were aware of the fact that, that they wanted to get into that wedding feast, but they were not ready to do so. They all slept, but at that midnight hour, only five were prepared to enter in. Now, we know from reading the parable that the key component of preparation was the oil or lack thereof. So what does the oil represent? What does it mean to have enough oil? What does it mean to be prepared for the coming of the bridegroom? Let's take a look at Matthew 25, verse 12. Matthew chapter 25, verse 12, we're looking at the end of this parable, and I want to talk about what it was that allowed them not to be prepared. In Matthew 25, 12, it says the following, but he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. This is the part of the parable that should jump out at everyone. They were invited to the wedding. They were ready to go into the wedding. But yet when, when the doors opened and they, and they didn't have the oil, the bridegroom looked at them and said, I don't know you. But here's our invitation. No, I don't know you. Preparation for the wedding feast or the second coming is all about knowing Jesus. It's all about getting to know Jesus. We can plan, we can plot, we can understand the signs of his coming, but in order to be prepared for his coming, we need to take time to get to know him. When Jesus comes, it won't be about false doctrine or error. According to what I'm reading here, the main emphasis will be about a relationship. I don't know you. In the parable, those with the oil, they possessed the character of Jesus. They knew him. The bridegroom can look at the five wise virgins and say with loving confidence, you I know. Welcome in. Friends, that oil for us today, it represents that 20 to 30 minutes you spend reading your Bible each morning. That, that extra time you spend in prayer, our, our oil is, is replenished when, when we seek conversation with God through, through prayer. The oil is full and overflowing when we take time to, to fellowship and, and share how Jesus has impacted our lives with one another. That's the way we, we keep that, that knowledge, that relationship with Jesus opened up. It's all about filling our hearts with the love and presence of Jesus. As Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's how you enter in. Christ in you, having a relationship with him. Ellen White in Christ's Object Lessons, page 414, as she is commenting on this parable, this is what her observation is. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. Do you know Jesus? That's the question as we prepare. 
In this first parable, Jesus breaks the mold by, by showing us that the primary way to prepare for heaven is developing a relationship with him. But he doesn't stop there, friends. He tells another parable because Jesus wants us to be prepared. He doesn't just give us one. He gives us three parables. And the second parable is about the talents. This parable is a continuation of the previous one. It also speaks of the kingdom in the future. It's another definition of how we should be preparing to meet Jesus. In this parable, a man makes a trip and leaves his servants with talents or, or money to care for. One servant has five talents, another one is given two, another one is just given one. When he returns, he, he rewards or punishes them based on what they did with those talents. Jesus is the man on that journey. He's now sitting on the throne in heaven. He left his disciples. He left us, and he's there, and he's waiting to come back. And, and often when we look at this parable, we look at the number of talents. So uh, the one that had five had more responsibility than the one who had two who had more responsibility than the one who only had one. But we should not be looking at the number of talents, but what we should be looking at is the fact that talents were given. Each talent, whether it's one, five, ten, or a hundred, is of eternal value in the kingdom of heaven. It represents the capability, not the importance of the person receiving it. Every servant receives something. In the same way, friends, God has a purpose and assignment for every believer in the kingdom. In order for the world to be ready to meet Jesus, we must come to the realization that each of us has been gifted in a unique way, a way that is needed in our church family. Each of us has a talent or an ability that no one else has. Jesus is the head of the church, and he put each of us here for a specific reason to carry out his agenda, the salvation of all humanity. The question we should be asking ourselves is, are we putting our talents to work or are we burying them? Part of the preparation is to use the talents that you've been given. If the church does not allow God to use their strengths and talents for his glory, the church will die and the mission of preparing the world to see Jesus will be sent elsewhere. See the Jewish nation, see the nation of Israel and what happened. Talents were given, the ability was given, the message was given, and it was buried. What are we doing in our talents today, individually and as a church body? I'm sorry, I'm speaking as your, I'm not your pastor, but I'm speaking in a pastor way. I hope that's, I hope that's okay. Well, well, well let, let's continue on. We, we, we are here. We are here today to introduce people to, to Jesus and allow them to experience abundant life through him. This is an impossible goal without every member of the body agreeing that each one of us is equally important in the mission of the church. It doesn't fall on the pastor or, or the, the head elder or the head deacon or, or whoever. We are all equally important in the eyes of the kingdom of God. Even if every person, in the sound of my voice, exercised one talent, one talent for the kingdom, this church would be an unstoppable force in this community and beyond. Which leads me to the final parable, coming to a close here in Matthew 25. This is all about the intersection with those in our community. This is also an important piece of preparation. Let's take a look at Scripture, Matthew chapter 25. I want to look at verses 31 through 36. Again, I'm abbreviating what I'm reading because of time, but Matthew 25, verses 31 through 36. Here's what it says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. 
all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Here we have a picture of all humanity standing before Jesus in all his glory on Judgment Day. Many wonder what that day will be like. How, how will I be judged? Was I, was I good enough? Did I, did I obey all the commandments? Did I conquer every, every sin? Was my relationship with Christ close enough? But as I look at this, this, this judgment scene, I, I see something different. I see the people, they're, they're separated into two categories, the, the sheep and, and the goats. And, and what's interesting is that the audience that is hearing this would have understand the difference between the two. You see, sheep and, and goats, they, they usually herd together, but they're very different. Sheep tend to be cooperative and, and inclined to stay with the herd, while the goats tend to be more independent and kind of wander off and do their own thing. It seems to me that sheep tend to be dependent on the shepherd and more inclined to stay with him and near him. I'm reminded of the words of Jesus and John. Chapter 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, goats, they're, they're, they're built differently. They, they seem to want to forge their, their own way, almost as if they're saying, you know, I'm shepherd, I could, I could do without a shepherd. A shepherd's okay, but I could, I could do without a shepherd. I, I could do things on my own. I, I'm okay. So the sheep are on the right, the, the goat. Goats are on the left, and the sheep tend to be more content to stay with the herd. And this is a perfect description of those people here in Matthew. They care about the herd. They're not just looking at themselves, but they're looking at those that are least among them. They're looking out for everyone. In fact, they display their, their love for Jesus by showing love for one another and by the ones that are the least of them. This love for others in the herd is yet another way to prepare to meet the king. In Matthew 25, friends, Jesus is trying to tell us preparedness leads to readiness. I want you to be ready, pay attention, have a relationship with me. I want you to be ready, pay attention, use the talents that I've given to you. I want you to be ready, look to the herd, to those that are around you in need, and show them acts of mercy. The actions mentioned at the end of Matthew 25 by Jesus represent a ministry of mercy to those in need. This is the core of true kingdom living. It is the core of what it means to be prepared and ready for eternity. Friends, these acts, they don't depend on wealth or ability or intelligence. They're simple acts, freely given and freely received. No special talent is, is needed to care for the herd. Jesus invites us to become personally involved in caring for others' needs. What we see in this text is a guide for practical discipleship. What it means to follow Jesus, especially in these days right before he comes. This parable is not teaching salvation by good deeds, that we need to do these good things in order to be saved but evidence of salvation through good deeds. Because we are saved, because we are preparing, we are doing these things because it becomes, it's natural to us. 
This is a primary indicator of readiness and fitness to see Jesus. I want to close by looking at the title of the sermon. I want to look at verses 37 to 40. Then I will, I will close. It says, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Those who are prepared for eternity are often unaware of their readiness. And the reason is not because they're not looking for the signs. The reason is because they are focusing fully and completely on Jesus and they're following his lead. The question is not if I'm ready for heaven. Instead, it's a question of the readiness of our hearts to surrender to a relationship with Jesus. The question is surrendering our talents to be used by him for our church community. The question is to surrender to serve the least of these. I chose this sermon today because of my conversation with, with Mike who came up earlier. He had, he had uh, contacted me and he came to Concord and I showed him some of the things that we were doing there for, for our community. As, as a pastor, once I came to Concord, I, I, I put my eggs in one basket. My, my, my ministry, my, my ministry um, mantra, if you will, is found in um, ministry of, of healing. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed a sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. Friends, as I'm ministering in, in Concord, I, I just want to share this. There's a high percentage of people that come to our food distribution from Antioch. There are calls that I'm receiving from Antioch. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, wouldn't it be great for the sister church in Antioch, and I know you're working on it, to be involved in this a similar type of ministry. For a while, I, I, I was actually driving to Antioch and delivering food, and I, I just couldn't do it anymore. And, and praise God, Mike came, and I knew that some help was on the way. So friends, I'm closing by saying that I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you that you find the, the right pastor, the right leader to lead you where, where God is leading this church. I'm praying that you as this church, this city on a hill will be a, a, a lighthouse to this community because there are many that are in need of help in the city of Antioch. I've, I've, I've spoken to them and I'm praying that you will continue to be a church that follows after God and that God will use you in a mighty and powerful way beyond what you can even think or imagine. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful today for the opportunity to have opened and studied your word. Lord, we know that, that there is a, an aspect of planning. And planning just leads to awareness. But Lord, we, we want to be beyond aware. We want to be ready. So prepare us, Lord. Prepare us by, by allowing each individual here and, and this church to prioritize a relationship with you. To prioritize the use of our talents for your glory. And prioritize reaching out to the least of those in this community. So Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would guide that you would bless, that you would fill this place with your love, fill this place with, with bodies that have been touched by your love through the people that are here. And, and may your name always be lifted on high, on high in everything that is done in this place is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. And may he give you peace in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. God's blessing on you. Thank you so much for having me share today.